Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 6. Matthew, chapter number 6. The title of the message this morning is, The Darkness is Coming. The Darkness is Coming. Each time I make that statement after I've originated that title, it reminds me of the writers the night when the British were coming. The British were coming. However, the attack that's coming to us now is much greater than what came to our continental shores several hundred years ago. The darkness is coming. And to be honest, even as I was preparing this message, I got scared. I got a bit frightened to think about what is taking place in our world today, that such darkness is coming upon our planet, but yet it's coming nonetheless. And I think our best defense, whatever it is that we do, is understanding what's happening so that we can do our best not to stop it, but to at least retard it a little bit. Notice, if you would, just one verse, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 23. Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and He says in verse number 23, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that Darkness. Now you'll notice there's an exclamation mark behind that. He's emphasizing that. How great is the darkness? He's making a statement and emphasizing it. I want to change it into a question and see if we can find an answer. How great is this darkness? A darkness is coming. How great is this darkness? If the Lord will allow me four thoughts this morning. Number one, darkness is a condition. Darkness is a condition. It's not just a thing. It affects things so that it produces an environment. For example, uh, darkness is the condition of creation. Darkness is the condition of all that God has made. Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse number 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, together unto now. The whole creation, everything that God made is groaning and suffering. Why? Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't just throw the human race into the pits of sin. They threw all that God made into the pits of sin, which means everything that is, is deteriorating both physically and spiritually. Everything that is, even the galaxy that we live in, is deteriorating, falling apart, both physically and spiritually. Now, what I'm about to say, I know conservatives are not supposed to say it, but I do believe that there is something to this climate change that the liberals are talking about. Now, listen to me real careful before you have that vote I've been talking about and vote me out. I don't believe anything that the liberals say. I don't believe anything that the news media says, but I sure do believe what the Bible says. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse number 18, that that, that there's a day coming, not in the too distant future, when the sun will be so hot that it would literally scorch the backs of the people that are on that planet this day. Friend, I don't know. I, I don't know if you want to call it global warming or climate change or just the judgment of God, but this place is going to heat up. Not only that, but the Bible tells us there's coming a day around that same time period. When the stars of heaven will fall from the sky like a scroll being rolled together. Same time period, the sun will cease to shine. Same time period, the moon will turn to blood. Listen, folks, this creation has been thrown into darkness and it is going to deteriorate. I don't know. I don't know if destroying the barrier reef will cause it. I don't know if if driving cars with fossil fuels will cause it. I don't know if having plastic straws will cause it. I don't know what will cause it, but this is what I do know. I know that this world, this galaxy, this creation, it's going to fall apart. And I have learned that God often uses man to create his own judgments. God often uses the foolishness of man to create his own judgments. We can't stop what's going to happen, but I'm telling you, it'd be a wise person to be careful with how you treat the things that God himself made and put into our care. Creation is in the condition of of darkness, but it's not just creation. 
The whole human race is in the condition of darkness. The whole human race is in the condition of darkness. John chapter 3, verse number 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. That's an astonishing verse, because Jesus is the light. He's talking about himself. Jesus is the light that came into this dark, dismal world. And yet, John chapter 1, I believe, verse number 5 says that they didn't even comprehend. The darkness didn't even comprehend the light. Wait a minute. We're talking about Jesus, the brightest light that's ever shown. And he's coming to the world, the darkest world that's ever existed. And yet that bright light, as bright as it was, could not even be comprehended by the darkness that was around it. Friend, that's, that's pretty deep darkness. When you're in such deep darkness that you can't see a light as bright as Jesus, that's a pretty deep darkness. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll admit Jesus was just one, but He's God. I don't ought to compensate for that. And, and He was veiled in human flesh. That made it a little bit more difficult, but He sure did do some divine miracles. And yet the world was so dark when Jesus came to it, they not only didn't, didn't see Him, they didn't even comprehend Him. Him. Now listen to me. The same kind of darkness that was here when Jesus was here is coming again. That same deep darkness is about to make another appearance. Somebody says, how great is this darkness that's on the way? Well, it's so great that some men from one side of the border could charge across their border and slay everything that's in their reach that's living. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, even every infant. And then retreat back across to the relative safety of their own border. But it's so great that the nation that was victimized will have to launch a counterattack, even though they know that most of the people that will be killed by their bombardment will actually be innocent of any of the things that were done against their country. Yet they'll have to do it anyway, just because you've got to defend your people. It, it's such a great darkness that people like us sitting halfway around the world will look at what's going over there and be pleased that what we think is justice is being carried out regardless of which side we actually think is the just side. I mean, there's people in America, and it looks like a great majority of them, that thinks Hamas was the just side. And there's people that think Israel was the just side. And we're sitting over here, and the darkness is so great. No matter which side you're on, you're shaking your head up and down, and you're saying, justice has been done. This is darkness. And it's coming. It's not just coming halfway around the globe. This is a darkness that's going to sweep across the entire globe. Read an article of a father whose daughter was one of the kidnapped victims last Friday night, Saturday morning, by Hamas. He's been waiting since to find out what happened to his daughter. And he found out she'd been murdered. And with tears running down his face, he balled up his fist and he shook it, not in anger at Hamas. He, he did it with a victory. Yes, yes. A, a, a kind of I'm glad situation. And somebody saw what he did. And they went and asked him, you just, you just heard that your daughter has been murdered. He's got tears running down his face. But yes. Why did, you, why did you respond physically as though you were happy? And he looked at that reporter and he said, because I know what Hamas would have done to my daughter if she was still alive. His prayer for the last seven days 
is that they killed her quickly. How great is darkness. It's great darkness. This is the darkness that is coming. But let me tell you something that's absolutely amazing that you need to consider. When the Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, He meant the men that murdered that father's daughter. When he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, he meant to go to that nation, to those very generals and to those very soldiers that were going to have to launch that intense bombardment into that land, knowing, knowing that they would be hurting innocent people, knowing they would do it, but he wanted them to hear the gospel just as well. When the Bible says, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He was talking about those Hamas people who last Friday and Saturday went across the border. I'm just telling you, this God that we love, He sees this entire planet of darkness. And I don't want to say this in a way that sounds wrong, but He's not on anybody's side. Now Israel, His people... I just preached on that last Sunday night. Israel is his people. He's going to stand by his people. But he's not on anybody's side. He's looking at a planet that's enveloped in darkness. And his greatest desire is that every living soul on this planet would come out of this awful darkness and would come into light. Darkness is a condition. It's a condition that has affected the entire cosmos. It's a condition that has affected the human race. It's a condition that has affected every human being. Every human being. Every one of us that's been born, and that would be all of us, has been born a sinner into darkness. Every one of us that has been born and still doesn't have Jesus Christ as our Savior we're living a life as a sinner in darkness. And every one of us that has not accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will die in darkness, a sinner, and be separated from God for all eternity. Darkness has affected us all. There's no one here that's exempt. Now here's the strange thing. If you were to go ask the people that at this present moment are living in darkness, if they're living in darkness, they'd probably tell you no. They're living in darkness, but they've always lived in darkness. So it's nothing new to them. You ask them, hey, you're unsaved, you don't know Jesus, you're living in darkness, you're headed to hell and damnation, nothing you do is pleasing God. If you were to ask them, are you living a good life? Most of them would say, yeah. Most of those Hamas soldiers, they think they just did God a great deed. They think they're living a glorified life. They think that they are the light, even though they are living in the darkness. You see, you have to understand when you've never seen light, you don't know what light is. Every one of us was born into a planet that has a gravity field. We've never known what it's like not to have gravity. We've never known what it is to be able to leap and just keep on going. And thankfully, It'd be kind of embarrassing. I mean, you just sail right off the planet sooner or later. But we don't notice the weight of gravity that's pulling on us. Why? We've never known anything else. That's exactly the way the human heart is. They won't know what light is until they stand before the God of light. And then they'll understand what they could have had and what they could have been, and what a mistake they made. But at that point, it'll be too late. 
because every human heart is born into the condition of darkness. Darkness has affected the cosmos. Dark, darkness has affected the human race. Darkness affects, we're born into darkness, every human heart. But darkness is a condition that grieves the heart of God. I don't think that there's any person on this planet who says no to God. I don't think there's any person. I don't care if it was the, uh, I hear Israel supposedly killed this past week. Whoever planned this last week's attack, whoever that leader was, I didn't read the article, they found him and they executed him or they found him and they snuffed out his life in some fashion. I don't think that man, as bad as he was, as dark as he was, I don't think God wanted that man to die and go to hell. I think God grieved over that man and what he's going to have to do to him. I don't think, I don't think God ever does anything but grieve over sinners that reject Jesus Christ. I don't think God ever does anything but grieve over a Christian that chooses to live in darkness as opposed to light. Many of us do. Many of us choose to compromise a holy, sanctified, separated life to live as much into this world as we can. I don't think God's ever pleased with that. I think God grieves over that every day that we're living in that atmosphere of darkness. Darkness is a condition that grieves the heart of God. Now listen to me. There's not a thing in this world I can do to fix the condition of this universe. It's just too big. I can't do it. There's not much I can do to fix the condition that the human race is in except tell people about Jesus one by one. I can't fix the whole human race. But I might be able to find one and tell one about Jesus and help that one. But now listen, you and I can fix the condition of the person who's sitting on our pew and in our seat. We can fix that person's condition right now. If we're lost, we can get saved. We can step out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And if we're a Christian, but we're living a, a, a compromising, worldly, carnal life, we can fix that right now. We don't have to wait till we see Jesus. We can fall on our face and say, God, I surrender all. There's something we can do to fix at least one person's existence on this life, on this planet, who's living in the condition of darkness. Number one, darkness is a condition. Number two, Darkness is a power. It's a condition, but it's not just a condition. It's also a power. Paul in the book of Colossians writes, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The power of darkness. Darkness isn't just an inanimate condition. It's not just an environment. It's also a power. It's a power that rides on a trident of three prongs. Satan is the head. His demons are the army. And the people of darkness are his kingdom. Say that again. This is how the kingdom of darkness works. It works. It's a force. It's a power. It's not a random power. It's not an uncontrollable power. It's a controlled power. How is it controlled? Satan is the head. His demons are the army. And those that are a part of his kingdom are the subjects, the force behind it. Now, you and I, every one of us, we have done battle with the head and with the army. We've done battle with both the devil and his demons. You say, well, preacher, I didn't know what I did. You probably didn't, but let me take you back. Remember when you were lost and somebody told you about Jesus? And you really weren't sure whether you wanted to get saved or not. As a matter of fact, you felt the desire that you might just soon stay lost as be saved. You were doing battle with the devil. And you were doing battle with the demons. That was them trying to pull you and keep you in their kingdom of darkness. You say, well, I don't really remember that. It's been a long time ago. Well, let me ask you this. Has there ever been a time in your life when you knew you were sinning against God? You knew what you were doing was wrong, but you didn't want to get right. 
you were doing battle with the devil and with his demons. Right then, they had you in their grips. They were holding on to you. They had pulled you across the boundary, back into the kingdom of darkness. They didn't want to let you go. You and I, every one of us, either have or still are doing battle with the devil and with the devil's kingdom. But most of us, most of us have never actually had to fight with the people that belong to the devil's kingdom. Most of us. Some of you might have. If, if you were one of those who really walked a wicked life, I mean, you really walked a wicked life. You walked down some really dark trails. You might have hung with some of the devil's crowd. Maybe if you were abused, if you were, if you were uh, somehow victimized by somebody, maybe as a child or as a young adult, you were, you were victimized by, well, you might, you might have been molested or done business with some of those that belong to the devil's kingdom. Maybe if you were a soldier and you fought in the war and you had to go fight some really bad enemies, maybe, maybe you were doing battle with the devil's crowd. But most of us, most of us, we've never really had to deal very much with the devil's people. And there's some reasons why. There's probably a lot of reasons why. Some came to my mind. One, I think, is because this nation has been so evangelized that there. The, the devil's crowd just not that big. Wasn't that big. I'm sure there's a lot, but, but, but not that big. You see, the devil's a spirit. His demons are spirit. For them to afflict anybody, they've got to get inside of a body. And if the majority of people around us are saved people, then there's just not that much room for them to be able to attack us. So because of evangelism, uh, the very fact that America was an evangelistic company, uh, country, that by itself kind of kept the devil squashed down on, a little bit, kind of like whack-a-mole. Uh, uh, grandkids had a birthday party, and I took them over to, or I didn't take them, went with them to Chuck E. Cheese's, and we played whack-a-mole. Uh, sometimes in a country where godliness prevails, the devil's just kind of scared to stick his head up. Because he knows some godly person will just pray it back down, just put the word on it. And just so, so in our country, because evangelism has been so strong, the devil's influence has been somewhat limited. But also because, because you and I haven't maybe had to deal with it. Hopefully it's because you got saved at a young age. And hopefully it's because you've been walking with a different crowd. And God and his power has been shielding you. But let me tell you, things are changing in our country. Darkness is coming. They're coming and they're loud and they're proud. And I'm not talking about just the homosexuals now. I'm talking about the whole kingdom of darkness is coming out and they're loud and they're proud. It doesn't matter what evil thought they have. It doesn't matter what degrading practice they believe in. It doesn't matter what horrible ideas they have. None of it matters. They're going to get them a parade. They're going to march down Main Street. They're going to shove it in everybody's face. Uh, our, our government right now, our government now is actually controlled by the powers of darkness. The principalities and the powers of America today are by and large, bought and paid for by the devil's crowd. They are belonging to the, the laws that we used to have to keep evil squelched. Hey, they're being repealed. They're being rewritten. They're being cast away. They're being ignored. Why? Because the devil's crowd is what's controlling America nowadays. Now get this. It means something. It means the powers of darkness have been turned Loose. They're not hiding in the darkness anymore. They're parading down their main streets. They're not sniveling in a corner somewhere. They're teaching your kids in school. They're not, they're not slinking around just in back alleys. They're running for public offices and sitting in White House and Capitol buildings. They are the power that's ruling our country. And they are using their power to take this country further into darkness. I'm telling you, the darkness, it's coming. Darkness is a condition. But number two, darkness is a power. Number three, darkness is a destination. Darkness is a destination. Sometimes when you're reading through your 
your New Testament, especially the words of Jesus, you'll hear him give parable after parable where he says, cast them into outer darkness. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, that's a place. It's the place where there's just deep darkness. There's two spiritual forces in this world and only two. I don't care how you divide them up, there's only two spiritual forces. There's God and there's the devil. That's the only two that there are. There's a thousand false religions. There's a thousand cults. The devil has a thousand ways to worship him. But it really doesn't matter what you call that particular branch of his theology. It's still Satan who's being worshipped through it. So there's only two powers, two spiritual beings. And it's incomprehensible how completely opposite they are to one another. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. There's not one speck of sin in God at all. He's all light. Satan is all darkness, and there's no light in him at all. There's no goodness, no redeeming quality, no virtue. There's nothing good about the devil at all. And these two forces are fighting for control of this world. Now, I say that, but you understand when I say fighting, God could end the, the battle in a second. I mean, God's omnipotent. But right now, there's a battle going on. And I can even tell you how it's going to end. God's going to let the devil win for a while. And the devil's goal is to make this entire planet Darkness. Darkness. Not one speck of light to shine anywhere. I, I, I've been thinking about this for a while. I can't even believe the devil likes to hang around with folks like that. I mean, why in the world would anybody want to hang around with somebody that's that vile and wicked? You'd think even the devil had higher standards than that. But, but his goal is to drag this world into a place where there's only evil perpetually. You say, is that possible? Well, think back to the Bible. That crowd that was alive in Noah's day, they had evil thoughts continuously. That's why God had to judge them. That crowd that was banging on the door at Lot's house, send those men out that we may know them. That's why God had to judge them. Even at Jesus' crucifixion, those that were standing outside the hall of Pilate, Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. No goodness, no mercy, not a shred in their heart. And these were some of the very folks that he had healed. These were some of the very folks that he had fed. These were the very folks that he had taught and loved on. Crucify him. How dark is this darkness? How dark is this darkness that the devil wants to inflict upon us? Total darkness. Not one bit of goodness not one bit of virtue, not one bit of morality, not one bit of cleanness. This is the devil's goal for this plan. This is the destination that the devil wants this planet to go to. And God's going to let him do it. He doesn't have to. But this is the darkness that is coming. I personally believe we're at the end of the age. I believe we're, we're nearing the time when Jesus will come back. I could be wrong. We might have a revival that will sweep across this globe. We might have godliness put back on the throne again. We might see the church bustling again. We might see all kinds of good things. And another millennial or two or three may pass. But it won't matter because the Bible tells us how it will ultimately end. Sooner or later, we'll get back to this place and it'll get worse, and God will let the devil win. This is the destination. I told you when I started this message, the more I thought about this, I almost told God I can't preach this. I don't like to preach sermons that just grab you and pull you down. I mean, where's the redeeming quality of a message like this? The darkness is coming. It's a condition. The darkness is coming. It's a power. The darkness is coming. It's a destination. And then I thought, number four, the darkness has also got an enemy. The darkness, it does have an enemy. What's the enemy of darkness? It's light. There's not but one thing that can defeat the darkness. Light defeats the darkness. How 
can we not stop? We can't stop darkness's flow. We might grab it and pull it backwards a little bit, but we can't stop it. Ultimately, darkness is the destination. But how could we retard it? How could we slow it down? How could we take the hands of time and back them up a little bit? Well, there's only one thing. We've got to produce more light. If light is the enemy of darkness then the only thing we can do to vanquish the darkness or to at least slow it down is we've got to produce more light. Well, how do we do that? Three things. Number one, the lost has got to get saved. The lost has got to get saved. You're sitting in this room today and you're lost. Whether you like to think of it this way or not, you're on the devil's team. You're one of the devil's army. You're part of his kingdom. You're part of what's pulling this country down. You're part of what's dragging this world into hell itself. You're one of the devil's henchmen. You say, preacher, that's pretty hard preaching right there. I know it is. And you might be thinking to yourself, it's just not true. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know everybody. I don't know everybody that well, but I'll tell you the truth. I have seen a lot of Christians that if they were Christians, they were A-W-O-L on God. They crawled over the wall. They were on absent without leave. They, they were doing whatever they wanted to do. They were, they were serving the devil. But to this very day, I have never met an unsaved person who through some part of his life, he's not still serving the devil. He could be a moral man. He could be a, 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 a hardworking man. He can be a decent man. But somehow the devil still has access to him and exploits them. He just doesn't let his army go AWOL. Somehow, he always keeps a root, a connection to them. And if you're lost, you're adding to the darkness of this world. First thing we need to do is if we're lost, we need to get saved. Second thing, if we're not living for Jesus, we need to live for Jesus. If we haven't got a light that's on a candlestick, we need to get our light put up on that candlestick. Matthew 5, 15. Uh, we're not supposed to have a light hidden under a bushel. We're not supposed to hide it under the bed. We're not supposed to hide it anywhere. We're supposed to put it on a candlestick that it might be able to be seen. God's not called us to be unlit candles, nor has He called us to be hidden candles. He's called us to get in the most public arenas we can get into and to shine For Jesus Christ. Now, you've got to know the whole story. If you do that, if you determine to get on a candlestick somewhere and live for Jesus, you will attract the army of the devil. They'll come after you. They'll come after you because you're doing what hurts them, what hurts their master, what hurts their kingdom. You're vanquishing the darkness and they'll hurl everything they've got at you. Not going to be easy. No, there isn't an easy path. Once we get to this place where darkness is, there is no easy path. There's only one of two things you can do. You can be the light that attracts the darkness, or you can be the darkness that attracts the wrath of God. Those are your only two options. You can blow out your candle. You can live like this world. But if you do that, whether you're saved or lost, you're not going to be attracting the devil's crowd, but you're going to be attracting God. God. And God's not going to be pleased with you at all. What he might do, I don't know. But I'm telling you, he's not pleased at all. So what's your choice? You either live for God and risk the ire of Satan, or you live for Satan and risk the ire of God. I don't know about you, but I want to, I want to live for God. I'm not saying I'm excited about what darkness can do to me, because I'm not. I saw an article last night. America's fixing to build three humongous giant prisons. Billion dollar prisons in three different states across our country. These billion dollar huge jails are to help be able to put prisoners away because at this present moment they don't have enough jails for all the crimes that they're choosing to prosecute, and they're just choosing not to prosecute a lot because they know they don't have a place to put them. I was looking.
prophet. I'm not a prophet that's a seer. I can't see the future. But I'm going to tell you, before those prisons fall down, there's going to be some Christians arrested in those things. There's going to be some Christ Christians behind the bars of those places for just doing what I'm doing this morning, for just doing what you could have done this past week, and I hope you did. Pass out a track. Tell somebody about Jesus. Talk to somebody that's living a sinful life and try to encourage them to walk away from their sin. Condemning pornography is wrong. Condemning homosexuality is wrong. Condemning lying and fornication. You do those things, and I'm promising you, I'm not a seer, but I'm promising you, there's a prison being built today that'll be around 100 years from now. I'm fully convinced there'll be some Christians behind those bars They'll call it hate crimes. They'll call it bigotry. They'll call it whatever they want to call it, but they'll put you in jail because this is what happens when as a Christian you put yourself on a candlestick. What can we do? What can we do? We've got to increase the light. If the darkness is coming, we've got to increase the light. It's the only way to, to push it back. It's the only way to keep it from getting any worse. How? Lord, People got to get saved. Saved people got to get right with God. And all God's people have to start sharing the gospel with others. All of God's people. Now, let me tell you, I understand right up front, probably 98% of you say, I can't talk to anybody about Jesus. That was my excuse. It still is on a bad day. When God called me to preach, I can't do that. You say, well, preacher, you seem to do all right now. What you do and you just keep on doing, eventually God gives you some peace and some courage and some comfortability with it. But you don't know how hard it was for me to get up and preach for the first time, the second time, the 3,000th time. You don't know. There's some times when I'm quite nervous even now. Not so much when I'm preaching to you folks, but when I preach at other places. Boy, it's just like getting the jitters all over again. You say, preacher, is it that important? Every person you win to Jesus, every person you win to Jesus, you take one out of his army and create another candle to shine for Jesus Christ. Everyone. You say, well, suppose I don't lead anybody to Jesus. Then you at least told that dark candle that God's still looking after him. Maybe you put a little bit of fear of God in him. Boy, I wish America had the fear of God. Man, I wish America, I wish this planet had the fear of God. But when somebody goes and tells them about Jesus, they know, hey, there's still some of those fanatics that believe. There's still some of those fanatics that care. There's still some people that believe in God. There's still some people that are determined that Jesus Christ is Lord and that there's a right. And, and they need to know we didn't die. They need to know we didn't quit. They need to know there's some of God's people that will still stand and will insist that righteousness be done. I really believe that the devil's whole goal is to cow us. He knows we're here. He wants to shame us so that we won't shine in a light that's not shining is not a light that's vanquishing the darkness, has no power, no influence. He can continue his plan. He don't care as long as you don't shine. But if you're shining for Jesus, you're causing a problem to the devil. The darkness is coming. I don't know what this world is going to... I don't know. If you had asked me 30 years ago to describe America as it would be today in 2023, I wouldn't have got it right. I wouldn't have thought we could fall, have fallen this far this fast. Never would have believed it. I have no idea what's going to happen. But I know you're either alive, you've got kids that are alive, you've got grandkids that are alive, or great-grandkids that are alive. And if we don't do something the darkness is going to consume this world while they're on this planet. We may not be here for the finale, but this darkness is a place they're going to have to live in. I want to do what I can to reserve a little place of light on this planet for them. I can't change the creation. I can't change the whole human race. 
I can change the person who's sitting or standing where I am today. May God help me to do that. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the privilege to preach. I thank you for the good book to preach from. And I pray, Spirit of God, you do what you will do today. You'd speak to hearts. Maybe some are thinking, I've tried to frighten them, but that's not what I wanted to do. But if, if they've been frightened, then good. We need to be frightened. The darkness, it's coming. God, help us not to sleep any longer. The night's here. Help us to do what we can to put light back into our community, to our families, and to our churches. Speak to hearts. Lead people to accept you as their Savior. Lead Christians to get right, to choose to be a voice for Jesus in a dark world. We'll do our best to give you the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name.